Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a show that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. On today, a two-part show. First, we have honored to have Brian Ball, the Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia, on how the state government reacted to the events of the past year to keep economic growth on track. In our second segment, the President and CEO for the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce, Joyce Waugh, will join us. And Secretary Ball, thank you for, for being with us today. We're really uh, honored with your presence. Um, let's get right into it. Uh, how did the Commonwealth, uh, Brian, spring into action a year ago when the pandemic hit and the initial safety precautions locked down many businesses, especially in the retail sector to a large extent? You know, what was the first order of business uh, as finding ways to provide a safety net for you and for the governor and for the state government? What was your first order of business? Uh Gene, first of all, thanks for having me. But uh, just to, to, and to, to respond to your question, um, the first order of business, we had our first case in Virginia March 7th. So we're about a year out. And, and uh, obviously, when this disease first showed up here, uh, there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern. We didn't know how it proliferated. Uh, uh, there was a critical shortage of uh, PPE personal protective equipment in the healthcare system. So we were dealing first and foremost uh, with a health crisis in the early going. Um, uh, what we did do, what we could do at that point, uh, we had no idea, uh, we knew we were experiencing a lot of job loss. Uh, we had no idea what impact uh, this disease was gonna have on our revenues and our ability to deal with, uh, with providing basic services. But what we did do is we set up an economic crisis strike force at the very beginning of this process uh, to assess the impacts of the disease, both in the, in the immediate term and, 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 and as this thing evolved. Uh, and, and we looked at ways uh, that we could support uh, the businesses that we have around the state. In the early going, the, the first uh, available funding was PPP money and economic injury disaster loans from the Small Business uh, Administration. We worked very closely with them uh, to get that money deployed. We work closely with banks and credit unions throughout the state to get that money uh, deployed. What we, uh, what we saw was that a lot of businesses were able to benefit from that. It kept a lot of businesses going. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting thing was the smallest businesses in the state uh, really didn't participate to the level that we would have liked. Uh, minority and women-owned businesses didn't really participate to the extent uh, we, we would have liked. Uh, uh, a lot of very small businesses didn't have pre-established banking relationships, things like that. So uh, as, we, uh, as we watched how this uh, pandemic evolved, uh, again, besides de dealing with the health issues, uh, we, we did set in motion a, a program called Rebuild Virginia, and that became enormously successful. And we deployed a total of about $120 million through that and uh, uh, we're very proud that about 58 million of that money was deployed to uh, minority owned businesses throughout rural and urban Virginia. So it was throughout, throughout the state and it was wildly successful program. And of course, the, if the Congress favors us with additional uh, uh, relief funding, uh, we're, we're hoping we will be able to re-engage because there's a lot of unmet need there still. How was the, Brian, uh, we're talking to Secretary Brian Ball from the, the Secretary of Commerce and Trade. How was the handoff from the federal government to the state and the state turning around, disseminating a lot of those funds to localities? Did that work fairly smoothly? Uh, given that there's no textbook for uh, uh, how you manage a pandemic and how you provide uh, <laughs> support to the most adversely affected parts of our economy, which was food and beverage and lodging and things like that. Yeah, if, as I look back on it, I'm, I'm actually, I, I think, uh, always uh, some hiccups uh, with it, both on the federal side and the state side. But I, 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 I think we're all very proud of what we did. And our, our greatest regret is that we know that there's a lot of unmet need out there still. So we encourage Congress to act. And, and, and we have a, uh, we're using the Small Business and Supplier Diversity Agency, as well as uh, 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 a nonprofit called Virginia Community Capital, and we have the infrastructure in place. So if we can get additional funding, uh, we we we'll get right back to work on this. Yeah, but one more question in this. But you know, so does everybody learn, uh, Secretary Ball, from something like this? Do state governments learn? 
Do local, local governments learn? Do businesses learn how to be more prepared if, for heaven forbid, something like this happens again? Check the box for all of the above. We're all better at what we're doing. And, and I, I have to tell you, it, for me on the commerce and trade side, it was so gratifying to see how businesses adapted uh, to this crisis and, and changed the way they did business where there were restrictions on how many people you could have in facilities and things like that. Outdoor dining, ABC allowing you to come and pick up uh, alcoholic beverages at the curbside, <laughs> things like that. So, yeah, I mean, you're 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 lear- you're building the airplane as you're flying it. But yeah, I'm I'm extremely pleased with with what what we've done, and 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 we can do better. We just need additional funding. Yeah, the day I brought my uh, margaritas home in a to go pack, I knew things <laughs> had changed. Uh, what, uh, Brian? What did you learn about the what? What did the state learn about the resiliency of the Virginia economy. You know, I know that it seems like tax revenues had not taken as big a hit as you had feared. Does that also show you maybe also point to the need to have a broad economic base? Uh, you know, uh, absolutely. And, and we, the, the, uh, our large businesses, our large manufacturing uh, businesses, our large, uh, uh, we have a lot of data, data related businesses throughout the state that we had attracted Amazon, uh, we got Micron making semiconductor chips. Uh, our, the breadth of our economy um, was was a godsend to us in this crisis. Again, in parts of our society, parts of our economy, very adversely impacted. But what we saw, we 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 sort of put the brakes on spending initially because unlike Washington, we can't print money, um, and and we we constitutionally have to balance our budget. So we were being very watchful. But what we saw as we got into this is our tax revenues held up because our employment, our large employers, uh, their employment held up. There are sectors of our economy that actually, I, I don't want to say prospered, but but actually did better, uh, not intentionally, but just because of what they were doing. We attracted a really good manufacturer in the, the Pennsylvania Danville area called Morgan Olson. They make step vans. They, they make step vans. Well, guess what? Everybody was, instead of going to stores, big box stores, people were ordering stuff at home. They can't make the vans fast enough. So uh, even in this uh, a mess, there were, there, were, there were companies that really prospered. And so our, our tax revenues held up. We didn't have to cut essential services uh, and and uh, we actually it, it, our reforecast we exceeded what we thought we were going to do. We also are benefited by having a large federal presence in the state. There are a lot of federal em- employees, whether in the military or uh, non-military portions of government. And uh, I was asked early on in my job to work hard to diversify us away from dependence on federal uh, government because you know we've had sequestration and closings and and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, we have done a lot of that, but I'm, I'm also very grateful that the, it, in, in, this envi- in this situation, I'm very grateful that mm-hmm. we've had the federal government uh, uh, so, so significant in uh, providing jobs uh, in, our, in our economy throughout Virginia. All right, let's move on. I wanted to talk, uh, Brian, about uh, uh, broadband. You know, one of the things that there's still a lot of people working at home or you know, kids been remote learning all year from grades, you know, one through college. My son's been remote learning at tech most of the year. So talk about what this has pointed out about the need to expand broadband, uh, Secretary Ball, especially in more rural areas. And and, and should should that be considered an infrastructure uh, issue? And does that need uh, federal as well as state money put into these these projects? How how important will infrastructure be? Uh, broadband is an infrastructure going forward. The governor recognized the importance of broadband from the very first, long before this pandemic. We made un- we made unprecedented investments uh, in broadband, uh, uh, getting broadband infrastructure in place throughout the state. Uh, initially, we were very focused, and we continue to be very focused on unserved areas, and many of those areas are rural areas. Uh, this pandemic has brought home the societal costs of this, and so we're also focused on areas where where it, there are uh, the economic disparities uh, uh, are are significant, and there are, there are communities that may have access but don't have the financial wherewithal to 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 access uh, broadband. And so we recognize both as highly significant needs, but you, it, it, 
take a school child. Uh, a school child in Fairfax County has ubiquitous broadband, has had for years. Uh, down in parts of your area, uh, that's not the case. And, and so there's just an innate inequity to that. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, it, it, it's broad, uh, broadband, I guess, isn't regulated as a utility, but it truly is, uh, uh, I, I think, something that we have to have for all our citizens. It's going to hold us back educationally. It's going to hold us back. Businesses aren't going to relocate or locate or expand in areas where there's spotty or no coverage. And so uh, we, we have spent, uh, we have earmarked unprecedented amounts uh, for broadband expansion. Uh, and we, we've taken CARES Act money that we've got. We, we've, done Fed, we've done Virginia spending at unprecedented levels. Uh, we have 50 million in the budget for, uh, for broadband this year. Um, and uh, we, we're, we've taken CARES Act money that we've received and, and made it available for, for, for uh, broadband. Sometimes it's a Band-Aid, sometimes it's a hot spot that we give to people to take to their homes or parking lot broadband. But, but uh, uh, Vadi uh, uh, is uh, the, the, the organization uh, that is working to uh, partner with uh, its government and, and, and for-profit businesses to get that last mile into a lot of uh, communities. Um, we have reduced the number. We figured it was over half a million folks uh, uh, or businesses when we came in that didn't have broadband. We've cut that number down by well over 100,000 and, and, and we're well on our way to cutting that down significantly further before we finish our term. Hmm. You know, one other quick question about this, you know, with so many people, uh, Brian, continuing to work from home, does it sort of change the, uh, the game a little bit when you're trying to attract businesses even to a, a, a state that, hey, you can put p workers here we don't have to build a huge office building, but if they like the lifestyle or something, like in Southwest Virginia, they, they can relocate here. Love Southwest Virginia for that. Um, so rather than uh, go up 60 or 70 stories in uh, Midtown Manhattan in a crowded elevator, uh, uh, what we are offering around the state and, 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 and in your area in particular, uh, we, we can offer uh, a headquarters could relocate to to these areas, uh, people, it's a combination. People aren't going to all work remotely or, or in the office. They're going to do some combination of both, but it's a heck of a lot easier to navigate around, as I said, your region. Uh, for, if you're working one day a week or one day every two weeks, uh, uh, you don't have to fight crowds, traffic, that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and then you can work remotely during the balance of that time. So we, we, we are marketing the state, uh, to that audience of folks who've decided, you know, maybe being in a, we don't have to be in a, in a, in a large Northeastern city uh, to do our business. We can do it in a much, uh, much more uh, pleasing environment in which to live and to raise a family and with a lot less headache and, and, and a lot less exposure to disease. So we, we, we're, we're feeling very bullish about that. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left with the uh, Secretary of Commerce and Trade, Brian Ball. I wanted to ask you about uh, programs like, like the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. Brian uh, help is bringing a MOG expansion down here to Christiansburg. Talk about VDEP and how it helps promote business expansion and about other programs like the Governor's Opportunity Fund that provide that extra jumpstart to help a uh, business locator expand. Talk about some of the programs that are available uh, that have helped businesses like MOG expand. Well, first of all, we're thrilled Moog expanded in Virginia and, and in your area, and we worked hard to make that happen. And the Virginia Economic Development Partnership is somebody our office works with on a daily basis. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the organization that's tasked with uh, economic development in Virginia, and that's whether it's an expansion, as in the case of Moog, uh, or bringing a new business, as in the case of take Amazon uh, into the state. So we're looking nationally and globally to bring in uh, businesses or either get them expand or bring in businesses. Uh, they have great programs, in, including uh, Virginia Talent Accelerator Program. They help with training uh, employees, making sure what's most important to an employer making an, an investment decision in Virginia is, am I going to be able to get the workers that I need? And, and uh, uh, VEDP has done a fantastic job developing as I said, the Talent Accelerator Program, we have the Virginia Jobs Investment Program. And then you mentioned uh, our Commonwealth Opportunity Fund, and that's, uh, this is, uh, getting businesses to expand or relocate is a very competitive business. We're competing with other states, with other countries, 
And uh, so that funding allows us to just help. Uh, if you if you say I'm going to spend X here and I'm going to employ this many additional people or new people, we we will provide incentives for you to do that. And and you mentioned Moog, but I, I actually just had to look back at since we've been in office at some of the projects we've done. Uh, Mack trucks uh, in Roanoke, uh, Volvo truck has done a huge expansion in Dublin. Uh, and uh, if we don't get those projects. It's not to say those plants don't stay there, but somebody else gets it. And when, when some plant is expanding and one isn't, it, it's usually not a good sign for the company or the facility that didn't expand it. So didn't expand. So Volvo was important. Klockner Penner Penner passed. I probably mispronounced that. Uh, traditional medicinals. That was a new one that we brought in. We were excited about that. I mentioned sure. Morgan I, Olson. I, I, uh, right. Traditional medicinals. I was there when the governor uh, announced that. You were probably there too. Yeah, we're very excited about that one. And the governor and I had been. Um, uh, I'm going to blank. I'm not sure I was, whether we were in Chicago or on the West Coast, but we started working with them. We went on a trade mission and, and started working with them out of state. Uh, Crown Holdings is they're going to be doing a new aluminum facility, a can aluminum can facility. Uh, Hershey, I mean, it's just, there's just, and I've, I'm only hitting the high, the high points. There's just, you just have to be in this business. You have to be talking to companies. You have to be talking to communities to make sure it's what they want. And, and, uh, we've had some great success in your area and, and we're going to finish out, uh, we're working projects there as we speak, and we're going to finish out on a strong note. I hope, I believe. Got about 30 seconds left with the secretary of commerce and trade, Brian Ball. Are you optimistic about even this year? Brian, uh, pent up demand, that type of thing. If more shots get in arms and things really open up, are you optimistic about what the rest of 2021 could look like? Nobody around here accuses me of being an optimist, but I am hugely okay. optimistic about where we're going to go in 2021 and what we're going to accomplish and what Virginia is, is going to accomplish. We have a strong pipeline. Our, our, our state is we're financially stable. We've got a beautiful state. We've got a great workforce. So I, I am very optimistic about where we're headed in 2021. All right, Secretary of Commerce and Trade Brian Ball, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll be right back with more Business Matters. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org. And we're pleased to be joined now by Joyce Waugh, President and CEO for the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Joyce, good to see you again. You know, we were just talking to uh, the Secretary of Commerce and Trade, Brian Ball. And, and uh, do you know Brian a little bit? And, and how is it, how, what's the relationship between the chamber and the state government? I mean, you, I know you lobby the General Assembly every year, but, but uh, you know, uh, you know what, what's your relationship between the, the state government and the, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce? So, so we're, we're, we're not government, but, you know, a lot of people confuse and fuse chambers with, with government and, um, and, and we don't do the kind of traditional economic development that, for example, the Rona Regional Partnership does in marketing or local government, local government economic development offices do in the way of taking care of their existing companies that often are where the expansions come from, as well as um, working with any, any one, any companies that might come into the area with an interest in locating here. Um, but we, what we do exactly to your point, we help strengthen the business climate so that all the companies that are here thrive, grow and thrive um, and give back then to their community because it's important for nonprofits, governments as well, and you know, for-profit businesses. So that strong business climate is a key part. We also, as you may know, um, host the uh, Roanoke Regional Small Business Development Center, which um, because of their, um, um, the, their funding, which comes partly from the US Small Business Administration through the state, as well as from a number of our members and beyond uh, sponsorships and underwriting, that, that matching dollars makes their services um, at no charge on the whole for small businesses. And if there's ever a time that, you know, small businesses need help, it's now. And I know I've talked to Amanda Forrester at the Roanoke SBDC. She said the seminars, webinars are, are filling up like never before. Yes. It, what, it what actually, you... Yeah. During, the, um, during that great recession, we saw a similar surge 
you know, over about a two to three year period. And, you know, of course, now I think it's even greater than that. You know, I'm just curious, um, the, the chamber, you lobby the General Assembly every year before the, what is it that you, that the chamber needs or doesn't want from the, the state government, you know, when they, when they start passing bills, what are you looking for? What's the best way that you are looking for the General Assembly to support what the chamber is doing? What we're ask, actually asking is for a, a strong business climate in the way of, so bills, for example, right to work is a big one. Um, and there, there are many other things there, for example, pieces, we never take positions on issues, only on people. I'm only on issues, not on people. I've pardoned me for saying that way, but um, there were, there are a lot of um, pieces of legislation that would often place even a bigger burden on businesses, most of whom are small. The large ones can uh, absorb that. For example, $15 an hour wage rates, you know, minimum wage, that actually sounds very good, but it sounds like it would be, it would be much better in the Northern Virginia, DC area. Actually, they're probably already paying it. Um, as opposed to here or some other smaller communities in Virginia. Um, you know, New York City and Roanoke, Virginia are, are a little bit different. Um, and and that's, that's, that's a, one of the things that, so often if legislation appears, I mean, I, I think $15 an hour, you know, wage rate that passed a year ago and then was put off until beginning this year. Um, but then there are, so that's one thing. So do you support? Do you support some type? Would you support some type of a minimum wage hike? Because I don't think it's been raised in the federal minimum wage hike has been hiked in many years. Well, I, I, we would, I believe we we have a we have our members that help us decide on some of these things. But we would support that, provided there were provisions for areas of the state or types of industry, you know. And usually there is a carve out on like restaurants, you know, where where you get a different wage rate. And then there are, um, you know, you have tips, um, you know, but sometimes it's childcare. Sometimes it's, uh, it may, maybe it's uh, other retail or something. The, some of those industries and some of the, some of the tourism, <clears throat> you know, in the hospitality industry, for example, they're already hurting right now. You know, please don't put anything else on them. Now, just to be able to live in Northern Virginia, absolutely, they need whatever they can get. <clears throat> so that... So, you know, state, if you have the, a national policy on that, and that is coming, it's coming, just be, allow some flexibility. Um, and there, there are others. I was just looking at um, what we had to our board today, uh, actually our exec committee. Um, you know, they're, they're, we always are, are supportive of, of measures that will help kind of level the playing field for career and technical education, as well as for, you know, career college bound um, you know, courses and coursework for that kind of support. Um, you know, the one thing that passed the House and Senate, we expect the governor to sign it, is um, is a piece of legislation that that you, I'm sure, have heard of. The G3, get skilled, get a job, and give back. Um, you know, it's, it would fund a program that would help uh, people do exactly that. Um, can't give back if you don't have a job and sometimes you can't have a job, you know, without getting a certain skill. So that one makes perfect sense. Um, economic development, you've probably heard a lot of those. Tax conformity, that was a big one. You know, everyone has desperately needed, um, you know, the, the, the PPP loans. And, and now it's like, wait a minute, you're only gonna allow us to deduct on taxes you know, up to 25,000 when we got, you know, 75,000. Um, and, you know, you're, so you gave us something and now you're going to hurt us. And so it looks like what the governor will be signing into law um, will, will be, I believe they have, maybe they have by this point, it was agreed to in conference committee was 100,000. That 100,000 is going to make a big difference because almost everyone, even some of the medium and larger companies didn't get much more than that. So that's a good threshold. So supporting those measures, and you're right, we do that at the at the state level. You know, we also do this at the at the local level when when there are issues at stake that are important, whether it's you know, Rock City, Rock County, Bottom Top, wherever. 
Uh, I've already got about a minute and a half left, Joyce, but I want to ask you, uh, what, what type of shape is your membership in uh, after the first year? Did you lose a lot of members? Did, was there a lot of businesses that went out of business? And, 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 and then secondly, are, 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 is your membership bullish about the coming year? We feel optimistic about the coming year. Let me answer that part first. Um, so we were able to keep a lot of folks on by uh, the generosity of, of, of members of our board who um, helped out on the membership for some of the smaller businesses, especially, or some of the nonprofits uh, this past year. Um, but like you said, a lot of, a lot of businesses are, are, are either out of business already or they're, they're just hanging on. Um, what we, what helped us last year, um, is, is what's, what may hurt us this year. So we're 131 years old, um, as an organization, uh, and, and business, business strength partner, if you will. Um, so last year, most everyone, by the time this hit, most of them had already paid at the beginning of the year, which used to be our cycle prorated to that time. Um, you know, in the last 30 some years is if you join in July, you renew in July. We won't truly know until after the first quarter um, how we're faring. We have, mm -hmm. a, in fact, we have a lot of companies that are saying, uh, talk to us and talk, talk to us um, after the first quarter. Um, and mm -hmm. that's for renewing as well as some, some of them for joining. Okay. Joyce uh, Waugh, President and CEO for the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce. We're going to have to leave it there, but Joyce, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me.